The topic of today's lecture is normal stress and shear stress. We're going to look at stress and what it is, the units we use for stress, and then we'll discover what direct normal stress and direct shear stress are. Stress is essentially internal resistance that a, um, a material responds to an external uh, load. So stress is just force per unit area, and it, it's a lot like pressure in that sense because pressure is force per area. But if you think about pressure within a liquid, imagine you have a, a sphere of liquid and you, you, you can compress it or you can push on it, you can apply a load, you can imagine the pressure would increase. Well, in the same way, if you have a sphere made of, say, steel and you put force on it, what will happen is force per area or stress will be developed within that sphere. The sphere may not be the best example. I'll use a pencil as an example quite a bit. So if I've got this, this pencil here, it's a relatively large one, it's sharpened on either end. I think it's an art pencil. Uh, but anyway, uh, if I take it and I grab onto it and I pull on it, right, so I'm applying a force in this direction and in this direction, well, imagine cutting this pencil right in the center, okay? So just in your mind, there must be something holding those two halves together if I apply a force like this, right? And it wouldn't be just force at a single point within the, the pencil's cross section. All of the cross section helps support that load. So I would imagine cutting this, and the area then would be the area that I see, the, the circle, and then the amount of force is however much pull I'm applying to it, right? And I could calculate the stress in this pencil as the force per area. Now, one thing to note that's important about this, as you pull on this pencil, it actually does stretch a little bit. Now, it's so small you probably couldn't detect it with your, you know, your bodily senses, but if you had sensitive enough equipment and you could apply enough force to this, you would see a stretch in the material. So, materials respond to externally applied loads by stretching or deforming to some extent. Some materials deform other, more than others. Um, wood is a relatively stiff material. If this was made of rubber, I could deform it quite a lot more with the same force. So they have different stiffnesses, and we'll study that as well. But the point is that stress is force per area. The units we have for stress in English are either PSI or KSI, where PSI is, of course, a pound per square inch, and we're talking pounds force, not pounds mass, because it is force per area. And a KSI is thousands of pounds per square inch. In metric units, we've got pascals as the basic unit of measure, but a pascal is a pretty small amount of stress. It's also a small amount of pressure in a liquid or a gas. But anyway, a pascal is a newton per meter squared, whereas a megapascal is more reasonable and is uh, newtons per millimeter squared. Now, it's worth writing this down. I don't usually ask you to write anything, but grab a pencil and paper and just make a note so that you can begin to memorize this because it's worthwhile. A, a, a gigapascal is a thousand newtons per millimeter squared. In other words, it's a kilonewton per millimeter squared, whereas a megapascal is a newton per millimeter squared. So make a note of that so you can remember it. Now it's possible that the stress will be uniform across the cross section. So if I'm pulling on this pencil again and I imagine cutting it and looking at the circle and trying to figure out where the stress or uh, what the magnitude of the stress is in the pencil, it could be just uniform. It could be the same amount of force per area. In other words, every little piece of area could have the same amount of contribution to supporting the load. It could be equal. It could be different. It, it could vary. So the stress can vary across the cross-section. The interesting thing about stress, though, is all of the stress has to add up to support the entire load. So you can think of this as being made up of a lot of very small rods. Think of a broom, right? If you try to break one strand of a, a broom, one, one a straw of a broom, it's, it's easy. But multiple straws together, you can't pull them apart, right? That's kind of what this is. As I apply load to it, it's not just one little section that's supporting that load. It's the entire cross section. Now, some sections may support the load more than others. That's just reality. But uh, it just depends on the nature of the design, the way the no load is applied and so forth, as to what the stress distribution will look like. Now, we are generally interested in stress at single points. And the reason for that is if we can find points where there is a maximum stress, and we know what the material is, we can tell whether or not the, the member will start to fail in that area. It only takes stress at one point that overcomes the material to potentially cause a cascading effect and make the rest of the material fail.
Here's an example of stress. It's just going to be a simple bracket like you might use for hanging something on the wall. And so on the back side of the bracket, there are a couple of holes that are you know, screwed into the wall, so they're fixed. They're not going to move uh, by comparison to the rest of the bracket. And we're going to apply a large force on the uh, end of this bracket. Now, if you perform a finite element analysis of this bracket, this is what it looks like. You can see the area where the stress is highest. Now, let's not get too far away from the idea of deflection. It should make sense to your intuition that that red area is the area that is going to stretch the most if we apply a load out at the cupped end of this bracket. That just makes sense because there's a support behind it that prevents motion of the bracket going back to the wall. But the section of the bracket that's cantilevered out beyond that support is of course going to stretch quite a bit. And hopefully your intuition is strong enough you already understand that back just in front of that support is where the material is going to deflect the most. So um, that's an example of stress and you see that in this body the stress is not uniform throughout it because the amount of stretching is not uniform. The, the deflection of the material is not uh, uniform throughout the uh, bracket. Now some materials stretch more than others given the same load. Some materials can take more stress than others. It just depends on the material. And So here's some representative materials uh, to show you what their, their ultimate strength is, what their yield strengths are, and their density. Uh, why would we care about density? Well, a lot of times what you really care about is strength per weight. And so a, uh, either ultimate strength per density or a yield strength per density, uh, which is not shown here, is useful and, and interesting. Plastics have relatively high strength to their weight. But of course, they're they're also fairly weak by comparison to the material. So, anyway, um, things like aluminum as well have high strength to weight ratios. Um, so you can see some representative numbers here. And it looks like if we could just make everything out of diamond, we'd be okay. It's relatively light and very strong, but obviously that's not really practical. <clears throat> Maybe someday we'll learn to do, to grow diamond crystals efficiently and cheaply and you can have that as your screen for your cell phone and your cell phone screen will never break. Alright, so um, direct normal stress is a very particular kind of stress. It's a, a very simple conceptual stress. Uh, remember I was talking about pulling this pencil apart by applying force to either end trying to pull on it. Well, if I assume that the amount of stress at every point in the cross section, again, imagine cutting this and you see the circle, right? It's got the lead in the center of it, but let's ignore that for now. If every point in that cut area contributes the same to supporting the, the load, then the stress would be equal, and that's something we would call a direct normal stress. Now, one really important thing about normal stress, when I say normal, I'm not saying usual. What I'm saying is perpendicular to. So if you look, I've got a, a graphic here that is somewhat like this pencil, right? It's, it's just a member that has tension in it and is being pulled from either end. You can see the imaginary cut there, and you can see the stress, the distribution of force per area within this. If that is uniform, then we're talking about direct normal stress. Uh, all the direct part means is that we've got uniform stress. Now, obviously this stress can either be tensile, so stretching the material, right, making it elongate, or it can be compressive. If I apply a force and I push in together, right, I'm pushing in, compressing it, well then that's crushing it, right? I'm making it deflect and get shorter. Now, of course, if this was made out of rubber, you could see it uh, compress much better. Now, is all stress uniform? Is this direct normal stress idea something that happens in the real world? Well, in the real world, stress is actually going to vary across any real cross section. There's going to be some, uh, you know, more deformation in one area than another because the, the material itself is not uniform, but this is a good approximation for many applications. Now, further, how would you develop direct normal stress. Well, look at the picture I've got there in the upper right. There's uh, several members that are pinned together. These, this might look quite a lot like the trusses that you've studied in the past. Just consider one of the pin members, and you can see how they've got two plates on either side of the pin to connect to the, the long members and support whatever load. This looks like some type of uh, architectural uh, installation. In any case, the pin, of course, is pushing or pulling on the plates and then the plates transfer that load 
to the round cylindrical uh, feature of the member. Now, where those plates connect to the cylinder, that's where the force is actually applied, right? So the, the section of the cylinder that is not connected to the plate would have no stress in it because there's, there's no force there. But imagine that you go out on this rod and imagine cutting the rod far out, the stress is going to spread out because think about it this way. Does that force just travel through just the section, just that sort of uh, rectangular section? Imagine extruding the end of the plate there all the way through the member. Is that the only material of the, the column, that round column that supports the load? Obviously not, right? It, it spreads out. So this direct normal stress is a good approximation for members like this, say in the middle of the member. But as you get towards the end where the, the force is actually applied that's causing the stress, well then this is not a very good approximation. Now the direct normal stress is called normal stress because the direction of the stress is always perpendicular to the applied force. Now force is a vector, right? It has magnitude and direction. Stress is also a vector, okay? It has magnitude and direction. And notice here that the stress, sigma, is the symbol we use for stress that is normal to the cut surface. One interesting thing that happens when you, say, stretch a pencil like this or you stretch this tensile test specimen is that as you stretch it, the volume of the, the component doesn't really change. Now it seems strange to say that something like rubber is incompressible. Imagine this pencil was made of rubber and I pulled on it. You can imagine, just like a rubber band, it would stretch and you might say, oh well, the, the rubber is re reducing cross-sectional area so the volume must be going down. Well not necessarily, you're stretching it out, right? So it's getting longer. In the same way, we typically don't change the volume of things hardly at all but we can stretch them and what happens is as they elongate since the volume can't change the cross-sectional area does and you can see how this particular sample it, we would have started as a a uh, rod that has the same diameter along the entire length but you can see how it has necked down there's been a permanent reduction in area of course if ultimately this thing fractured and failed but what does that do to the stress well as one particular section of the specimen shrinks in area, the amount of stress in that area goes up, right? Because it has to take the same force that any point along the length of the member should, or well, has to take. But now there's less area to do it, so the stress goes higher, and you can see how there's sort of an avalanche effect and, and why there would be just one area that necks down permanently and that's where the failure occurs. Well, wherever the, it's kind of like a chain. Whichever one is the weakest link, that's the one that's going to break. And once it starts breaking, it's, it's downhill from there, right? That's where it's going to continue to break. Now, one of the concepts we have to do, introduce is a stress element. Um, if you think about this pencil or any material and the way it uh, responds to load, it's helpful to start thinking about uh, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller points because we're interested in stress at, at points and ultimately we could make a good approximation to this pencil building it out of little bitty boxes, right? That's basically what normal stress elements are. And in finite element analysis, that's really what is done, right? A, a body is broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. Maybe those pieces are little squares like we're going to do or maybe they're some odd shape, but Ultimately, in order to solve a finite element analysis program, what the machine does is just break down the body into a finite number of elements and just assumes that there's static equilibrium between those elements. And of course, they might stretch a little bit and change form a little bit, but basically treats them as uh, a lot of little elements connected together by springs. We're going to go a lot farther than that. We're going to go down farther to what we would call an infinitesimal element, all the way to the limit where this element has zero size, uh, zero volume. I've got extremely small volume or area there, but really these stress elements go all the way down to a zero size. It's kind of like in calculus when you uh, have a differential variable that's going down to a, a zero length. Now we can consider these stress elements as a three-dimensional object. Sometimes that's not really useful. We don't really care about what's going on in, in uh, one of the directions and we only want to consider two directions. And of course in our example here we're only considering a single direction because we're talking about direct stress. Uh, 
Um, so we can look at these as two-dimensional elements or three-dimensional elements, but the important thing to realize is if we're taking a body and cutting it down to smaller and smaller pieces so that those pieces become infinitesimal, right? Just super small. They have zero size, zero volume. If we do that, then the the stresses, which are kind of, you can think of them as forces, that's what I'm struggling with, is it's helpful to think intuitively as if these are little boxes connected together by springs, like I said, and you're thinking about the force between them. But since it's force per area, it's really a stress that we're applying to these. And for that, that little bit of material to stay you know, still or static within the bulk of the body, the stress on either side of it has to be in equilibrium. It has to be the same, you see. So whether the stress is a compressive type stress, and that's what you see in figures A and B, where the stress arrows are pointed inward, or if it's tensile, like in, well, I guess they're all labeled A and B, aren't they? So on the left is compression, and on the right is, is tens, uh, tension or uh, tensile stresses. But the point here is that those normal stresses have to be equal and opposite. Now, you, you look at this and you say, well, you drew an, uh, an element a minute ago where it was cut in the middle, and there are a bunch of stresses on the surface. There are a bunch of arrows. Why only have one here? Well, because we're trying to get it down to the point where we're, we're just dealing with point-sized things, things that have no size. So it's just one stress uh, number on, on that surface. So we use these to analyze stress at uh, a point. Now there is another type of stress. There are two basic types of stress, and that's really what we're introducing in this, this section. Uh, one stress is normal stress. The other is direct shear stress. So shear stress is a very different type because the, the force or the stress acts in a direction parallel to the surface that's going to fail. So uh, a good intuitive picture for this is the test fixture fixture all the way on the left. There's a load applied through a load block to a section of wood grain material. And if you know anything about wood, it's pretty easy to get wood to cleave along the grain lines. And so you see that dotted line between A and B. That's where there's a surface and the, the, the block is going to fail if we apply enough load. Because if you think about it, that load P is being carried along that entire surface between A and B. Now, this is something that's very common. If you know anything about sheet metal, one of the common um, uh, uh, techniques for, for working with sheet metal is to simply punch out whatever shape is needed. And so here's a, an example of a fairly simple punch, just an oblong uh, piece that's supposed to push out a slug. And if you think about the area around that slug, where the, the metal's very thin, so there's not much area, um, because it doesn't have much height, but it goes all the way around the perimeter of the shape, that's the area that experiences direct shear stress. Okay, so the, the load is carried by, uh, from the punch, is carried by all of the material around the shape. Now, in real punching operations, typically what happens is the punch is not just flat and it doesn't try to punch out the entire shape at once. As a matter of fact, typically it's sharp on one end and will start the punching operation from one end of the material and advance more like scissors throughout the entire uh, material. I uh, finally realized this one day when I went to use a shear. It was a, a, a powered shear. It was driven by uh, pneumatics and I just needed to take a flat piece of material. It was some um, uh, flashing actually for a home and it was galvanized so I just slid it in and the shear came down. Well the shear came down and cut it but it didn't come down straight and just cut all of the material at once. Rather, it came down at an angle, so the cut began on one end and progressed along the length of the, the cut. And it's very much like a pair of scissors, right? So this is very much a scissor-like action. You can think of it that way uh, for um, uh, stress. So in fact, scissors are devices that purposely introduce sheer stress into material in order to separate the material. So if we take that load that we had, P, and apply it over the entire surface equally, then we're talking about a shear stress that is a direct shear stress. And you can simply calculate its magnitude as the load over the shear area. Now let me go back and describe. The shear area would be simply D multiplied by C. You see those two dimensions? That would be the quantity of shear area and then the load that I had as F in the equation would be the load P that's applied by the load block. 
So hopefully you can visualize that area and see it. And notice the important thing about direct shear stress is that the stress is in the, it's, it's like it lies along the surface that's being sheared. Okay. So that's why it's direct shear. Shear is a type of stress. We give it a different symbol than direct normal stress. We give it the symbol tau. That's what that funny looking T is. Rather than sigma, which looks like a kind of a sideways six. Uh, we give it a different symbol because the direction of the, the uh, uh, stress is parallel to the area that would tend to be uh, carrying it or that would tend to fail. Whereas in normal stress, the stress is normal to that surface. Now, shear is something that's very important. It's very common to use shear pins. Shear pins are pins uh, that are loaded in shear. If you think about what's going on in the, the upper view, you've got two uh, links connected together, a link and a base, and there's force being applied to the link and a reaction force on the base, and the pin is what prevents the link from coming away from the base. Now, if you think about the area being sheared, the area is simply the area of a circle, right? Imagine cutting that, that pin and looking at its cross section, you would see a circle, which has shear area pi d squared over 4. Now, there are other things. Hopefully, at this point, your intuition is saying, well, wait a second. It seems like since this force is offset from the reaction force, there's also going to be some bending of that pin. And you are correct. That is true. If that's the case, that's something we'll study a little bit later. But one way to over, and let me back up, that does cause more problems with the pin. The pin will fail sooner than you would expect. One way to overcome this that's very common is to uh, apply double shear to pins. And so if you look at the lower image, you can see how the base material has been expanded to, to wrap around the link. And now the pin has two shear planes that are supporting the load and, of course, less bending then. There's still some, but for now, we'll neglect that and just uh, imagine that this is in double shear and that the shear is just direct shear. So the only load in the pin material is a shear load. Um, I guess that's enough now. There's something else I wanted to say there. Oh, yeah, the, the most common type of shear pin is just a bolt. And you can see why it's important to not apply this shear load to the threaded area of a bolt. Because in the threaded area, if you imagine cutting that, there's less area available to carry the load. Plus, there's something called stress concentration due to the shape of the, um, the threads in the, the fastener. Um, so that's why you you know if you ever got a bolt from the hardware store and you know you couldn't thread it in as far as you wanted because there were only threads on the end and you wondered well why the heck don't they just thread the whole thing well a lot of times fasteners are applied in shear and so you don't want the body or the the um, uh, there's a name for it well you don't want all of the the body of the bolt to be threaded the shank, that's what I was looking for. You don't want the shank to be threaded because you're going to apply shear stress to that section. You want as much area available as possible. So here you can see the pin, you can see the shear area, and we've removed the top section so you can see the shear stress on the cut section. And notice that that stress is in the same direction. It, it lies on the face of the, the cut surface. Now, we can also apply shear stress to the stress elements we talked about before. Now, if there is a shear stress, you can think of it as, let's see, if I take my calculator and I apply a force to the top, let's see, this will come off this way, you can see it. If I apply, no, it doesn't, I'm sorry, this, uh, this is not like my other calculator. I was thinking the back slid, but that's not the case. Anyway, if I apply a force to this, I'm, I'm applying a shear stress to the surface of this calculator. Well what does it take to support that calculator? If I were to simply apply a load this direction, it would accelerate to the left, right? So I have to uh, apply a load somehow to the bottom to keep this thing in equilibrium. Well, if I just apply a force couple, right, or a shear couple to the top and bottom, the stress element's going to rotate. So I need an opposite couple in order to keep the thing in equilibrium and prevent the element from rotating. So if there's one shear stress on the element, there are four, right? There, there have to be four because you've got to prevent that element from accelerating. You also have to prevent it from rotating. So shear stress is very different from normal stress because of the way that the material has to respond so that it doesn't simply come apart. Now contact stress is another type of stress that I'm going to throw in here. 
Uh, contact stress is interesting. It's something we'll study and deal with a little bit more, but in a different way once you get to machine elements. But contact stress is typically where you have two pieces that are in contact with one another, but the contact area is very small, and usually theoretically it is a, uh, an infinitesimal, a zero contact area. So any force causes theoretically an infinite amount of stress. So the way that the material has to respond is, you see a, a, a ball like a ball bearing on top of a flat surface here. The way the material has to respond is it literally has to deform. There's, there's no other option. It has to deform. And it has to deform most at the point where contact was initially uh, you know, initiated, I guess you could say. So the, it has to, to flatten out to some extent in order to provide some non-zero area to carry the, the load P, because there's no material that, has, that can stand up to an infinite amount of stress. So things like cylinders on flat surfaces or spheres on flat surfaces, these are, are contact stre type stresses. There's another type of stress called bearing stress. Bearing stress is where you have uh, two different components resting on one another. So if you imagine that uh, my calculator, if I rest my hand on it or my foot on the ground, really that's a bearing type stress or what's shown here are two bones in contact with one another. So there's a, a relatively large area of contact uh, so that the, the force between the contact can be spread out over a relatively large area, thereby reducing the amount of stress. Um, there's an interesting application. I, I live down a gravel lane and I've got a gravel driveway which I, I don't particularly care for because my house actually kind of sits up elevated a little bit. It's not exactly a hill but there's a good you know 10-20 feet difference. I, don't, I haven't measured it. I don't know what it is. Probably about 10 foot difference between the level of the home and the level of the lowest point of the driveway. Well, it also happens that water rushes across that section of my driveway when it rains really hard, and it washes out the gravel every time. I'm sick and tired of it, and I've said I'm going to do something about it for several years now. Of course, being an engineer, I want to do it right, and that means doing a lot of work, and I never quite get the time to do it. So, anyway, what I want to do is I want to build an arch. I want to build a concrete arch, but I don't want something that's just simple concrete, and that's really what's slowing me down is the fact that I won't just get out there, build forms, and pour concrete and be done. I want something that looks nice. I want something where once I build the arch, I want to put stone on the sides and make it really pretty and so forth. Well, think about it with me for a moment. I'm not going to remove enough earth to get down to bedrock to support this bridge, and yet the bridge, this arch, has to support the weight of a vehicle going over it every day. As a matter of fact, I want to build a workshop and the workshop is going to sit on the house side of this bridge and that means that the bridge that I build if I build it first needs to be capable of supporting the weight of a fully loaded concrete truck that's quite a lot of weight now if I don't go down to the bedrock and tie the the structure into the bedrock what is going to support all that weight obviously the material the concrete that I make this from needs to be reinforced so that the structure itself doesn't crack but what's going to support that structure it you know in the first place well, essentially mud, right? The, the dirt, the, the soil beneath it is what will support this. And so I have to pour something called a footer. And what that is is just a piece of concrete that is large in size, relatively large, so it contacts a lot of surface uh, of, of the soil so that when you apply load to that, that footing, that load can be spread out and so you don't overcome the soil strength because soil is actually not all that strong. Um, there's a video I've got that I require you watch by um, the channel called Practical Engineering where he shows you how to support the weight of a car on a column of sand, which is really interesting. So I recommend, well, don't recommend, I require that you watch that and think you'll really like it. But ultimately, I have to somehow support the, the weight and the load of the structure as well as whatever goes over it on soil. So I have to know how strong the soil is uh, in, or, in order to determine how big the footing area needs to be. And there's some guide there that I've linked to if you want to see it and some information in your text uh, about uh, bearing stresses. So in summary, what we've looked at is the fact that stress is internal resistance that a body automatically responds with to an externally applied load. Stress is simply force divided by area. It's just a ratio. It's a fraction. Uh, there are two different types of stress primarily. They are normal stress and shear stress. And all of the stresses we looked at, contact stress, bearing stress, 
every load applied to a material ultimately comes down to a combination of normal and shear stresses. And we'll see that as we go along in the course.